Hello and welcome to tuberculosis part 4. So far we have seen the current guidelines, the treatment regimens for different types of patients and we also saw in details in part 3 the first line oral drugs used in management of tuberculosis. So now in part 4 we will go on to see, seeing the injectable first line drug, injection streptomycin and from the second, third and fourth group, that is the second line drugs, we will talk about the drugs which are actually being used in the RNTCP regimens. So let's start with streptomycin, the first line injectable drug. We saw all the four of the five drugs are oral agents. So streptomycin is the first anti-TB drug. And because of its limitations, it had to be given for 24 months at a stretch with CY. Mechanism faction is it binds with 30s ribosomes, the protein synthesis unit, causes misreading of the codons on the messenger RNA, and ultimately, the altered proteins synthesized result in impairment of cell membrane integrity. And therefore, like all other aminoglycosides, it gives us sidle effect. Resistance develops rapidly if used alone by development of drug destroying enzymes, alteration of the ribosomes that target molecules, reduced cellular uptake. And the important peculiarity about resistance developed to streptomycin is the resistant microbes become dependent on streptomycin. So when streptomycin stops being able to kill them, in fact, they survive with the help of streptomycin. And therefore, as soon as streptomycin resistance is detected, streptomycin has to be stopped. Otherwise, it ends up helping the microbes. As we said, it's an injectable drug because it's an aminoglycoside, a quaternary nitrogen compound, having a positively charged nitrogen. And because of this, the kinetic peculiarities which result because of this quaternary nitrogen is, it is not lipid soluble, it cannot be given orally, it has to be injected intramuscularly, it cannot enter the macrophages, that is why we discussed it had to be given for 24 hours, till the only when the microbes, the bacilli came out of the macrophages, streptomycin could exert the sidle effect. Similarly, it doesn't cross the blood brain barrier, doesn't go into the CSF, so it's not of any use for TB meningitis, because it is lipid insoluble, liver doesn't bother to change it. It depends entirely on glomerular filtration rate for its elimination. And because GFR would reduce in renal impaired patients or with age, that limits its dose in these patients with reduced GFR. Common adverse effects of the group, autotoxicity, nephrotoxicity are shared by streptomycin, though it is the least nephrotoxic of all the aminoglycosides. Amongst autotoxicity, vestibular and cochlear, it has more vestibular toxicity, the balancing apparatus, than on the hearing apparatus. The group 2 agents, the injectables, also include two more aminoglycosides, canamycin and amikacin, which are used for multiple drug resistant tuberculosis. Canamycin is the drug used. Both have more cochlear damage ability than vestibular and both are more nephrotoxic than streptomycin. Out of the two, canamycin is cheaper and is being included in the regular MDR-TB regimens in the, by RNTCP. Amikacin is safer but costlier. Coming to fluoroquinolones, the group 3 antitubercular agents, second-line drugs. Mechanism of action is inhibition of DNA gyrase. This DNA gyrase is important for preventing damage to DNA when it is getting replicated or when a messenger RNA is formed by opening out the strands of the DNA. And if this DNA gyrase enzyme is inhibited, then in the process of either replication or transcription, DNA gets damaged because of overcoiling. Hence the effect is sidle. And it works on extracellular as well as intracellular bacteria. 
amongst the fluoroquinolones, moxifloxacin is the most effective, then levofloxacin, then ofloxacin. Resistance is rapid if used alone. And amongst these, it is slowest to develop against moxifloxacin. Resistance occurs by mutation of the gene, which codes for the enzyme DNA gyrase. However, in the RNTC guidelines, it is levofloxacin, which is being currently used in the regimens in force. All of them are well tolerated. Tendonitis and damage to weight-bearing joints in children are the commonly reported adverse effects. Even then, they're not so common. So they're well tolerated agents. So levofloxacin, as I said, is being included in the RNTCP regimens defined by 2016 guidelines. Moxifloxacin has been tried elsewhere even as first-line drug instead of ethambutol. So the combination of four sidel drugs, HR, Z, and M, allows even reduction of duration of treatment to less than six months. But however, in India, it is kept reserved for multiple drug resistant tuberculosis or extensive drug resistant tuberculosis. From group four, other oral agents, we're going to study three of them. The first is ethionamide, which like INH, it inhibits mycolic acid synthesis by forming the active intermediate, which is formed inside the myc mycobacteria. It interacts with the same proteins which are involved in the mechanism of action of INH, and it comes into use when INH is not working. Effect, acidal, extra, against extracellular as well as intracellular bacilli, and it also gives us good CSF concentration. It can also be used for TB meningitis. Resistance is by reduction in activation of the drug by mutating the gene coding for the activating enzyme. Adverse drug reactions can be very frequent GI disturbance, hepatitis, rashes, peripheral neuritis, menstrual disturbances and importance. So to, because of these adverse effects, it needs to be started at a low dose, 250 milligrams per day, and very gradually, the dose is increased to 750 milligrams per day, which is the dose for tuberculosis. And because it can cause peripheral neuritis, whenever ethionamide is used, pyridoxine 100 milligrams per day has to be given throughout the treatment regimen to minimize the neurological adverse effects. So it's reserved for MDR-TB, and it is also useful for mycobacterium avium com complex in AIDS patients and in it's a reserve drug for leprosy as well. The next group four agent, cycloserine, it inhibits the cell wall synthesis, but it is acting on the innermost layer, that is peptidoglycan layer. It inhibits the cross-linking there, like beta-lactams. It is giving us bacteriostatic effect. Resistance can occur, but it is slow to develop. And importantly, it doesn't show any cross-resistance with other anti-TB drugs. But again, important adverse effects are neuropsychiatric adverse effects. Headache, sleep, tremor, slurred speech, depression, psychosis, and even convulsions. So it is also started at low doses, 250 milligrams per day, and gradually increased to 750 milligrams per day, with pyridoxin, 100 milligrams per day, to reduce the neurological adverse effects. Because of all these toxicities, it is used only for multiple drug-resistant tuberculosis. The other oral agent, para-aminosalicylic acid, works like sulfonamides. It inhibits the folate synthetase enzyme. So bacteria manufacture their own folic acid from PABA by the action of this enzyme, folate synthase, and PAS, like sulfonamides, can inhibit the conversion of PABA to dihydrofolic acid. So it gives like sulfonamides, tuberculous static action, and it doesn't enter the CSF, so it's not of any use for TB meningitis. Resistance is slow to develop, and importantly, it reduces emergence of resistance to other anti-TB drugs. However, it's required in large doses, and therefore, gives poor patient compliance. Large doses accompanied by GI disturbance, rash, fever, malaise, it can result in hypokalemia, also goiter and liver dysfunction. And if it's used as a sodium pass, 
sodium salt it can cause sodium overload because of the high dose which is used so 10 to 12 grams per day is the daily dose it is given in divided doses as tablets or as granules status again only for poly drug resistant tuberculosis so that completes our details of all the drugs which are being used in the rntcp drug regimens so across the four parts we have seen what are the hurdles in management of tuberculosis we have seen the rationale for strategizing the multiple drug short course treatment why multiple drugs which drugs why they are specifically chosen how are they administered the development of fixed dose combination tablets to facilitate ease of administration what are the current patient categories with the current drug resistance scenario and what are the regimens for these categories and in parts 3 and 4 we have seen the individual drugs in details with their current status in tuberculosis i hope you enjoyed studying tuberculosis understanding the management of tuberculosis pharmacotherapy of it and thank you let's meet again for further topics do visit funwithpharmac.com you'll find many more lectures there thank you